cue Hawaiian intro to the uh, serviceman's home and church in Hawaii. Aloha! So today is Sunday, and it is the 8th of October, and that means we have... Okay, ready everyone? Let's count with Pastor. The 9th, the 10th, the 11th, 12th, 13th, Friday the 13th, uh, uh, Saturday the 14th, Sunday the 15th. Then Monday the 16th, that's when all the heavy hitters start showing up at church. I actually don't know where to start with this one. I hope it, it is as glaring an example of the NTCC class distinction that's out there. Uh, people say and do things that make it obvious here. He's calling heavy hitters coming in, showing up to church on Monday. Heavy hitters are, you know, they're either the, the powerful or influential people. Um, when I used to play softball, a heavy hitter would be someone who uh, was important to the team because they hit the ball a lot. So what does that make everyone else there? Are they... Bench warmers, second string. Um, and to those who are in, this, this might seem a point of pickiness. But to those of us who are out, especially, and maybe you are in, maybe when you hear these things now, you're like, whoa, what am I? I'm sitting here in church. I come all the time. I pay my tithe. Crying out loud. Am I not a heavy hitter? You know, back in New Jersey when I was growing up, there was a saying, um, mostly among my mom's Jewish friends, because to me, everyone in New Jersey when I was growing up and a kid, I thought everybody was Catholic or Jewish. I was very shocked when I went back home later in life and drove around town. I was like, where did that Baptist church come from? Or that Lutheran or Methodist? So uh, there's a lot of phraseology that, um, that, that is in my repertoire. And one of them is, what am I, chopped liver? Like, am I socially just a nobody, disrespected? Um, I'm nothing. I'm chopped liver, whole liver or chopped. I don't like it either way, so um, I, th I think this is disgusting because you, you are saying the opposite of what, I, you know, I think that was something that always was in the back of my mind was, I don't get it. I didn't get the special parking spaces for the pastor and the associate pastor and all the other board members and things up in Graham. Um, usually when you go out to a church and you're just building it, I would hope most people are like, they park and they walk up as the pastor or the pastor's wife. You don't take the best spot. You leave that for people who you want to come. You. The least among you is the greatest. That's why it's gross that there are special seats up front for these heavy hitters. And they sit in their nice chairs behind the pulpit and look out and watch everybody. And they get first place for everything. You just watch. If you haven't seen it yet, if you're new to the group, keep an eye out. That's what they do. They have the best spots. All of it. They have the best of everything. They sit at the head of the table. No, you know what? You shouldn't even be sitting. You should be waiting on people. You should be serving them as the pastor, the pastor's wife. Don't sit your butt down in a seat and wait 
for the finest things or bellow like Davis did in the Philippines. I don't like cake, I like pie. Just sitting over there by himself. That sticks with me, you know why? If it wasn't for those other beautiful souls around me to kind of soften that or distract me from it, that was something I remembered all through the years because he behaved that way. I saw it even worse when we were in the Bible school or you went to his house for fellowship, which was the worst experience. I don't know whoever wanted to go there. It was such an uptight play, uh, place situation to be in, just uptight. But anyway, this bothers me so much because then I have to wonder, what is this man preaching to these GIs? What? And, and I can picture that place because when, when I was in the Philippines, I took a space A flight to go home. Um, I'd been married and, and um, he was stationed in New York and I was in the Philippines so I got some leave time and I hopped on a space safe flight at the MAC terminal at Clark Air Base, went to Guam and I never even stepped out of the terminal because, you know, it was my first time space A and I didn't want to lose any, um, lose my seat. Well. <sighs> The next morning when they were supposed to leave again, we were told that the pilot of that flight was not going to release as many seats going from Guam to the mainland. So several of us just kind of, including a few families, we just kind of shuffled around the terminal uh, for like three days until we could finally get out of there. And we got out at the just the mercy of some Marines. I will always love the Marines for this, even though their planes way up high are cold and they should have nice hot blankies, but no, they didn't. And we were not dressed for it. Um, we were eyeing with envy the one couple that had, um, they had one of those mink blankets from South Korea, but they had a little baby, so we could, we could give them a pass on that, that they didn't let us all huddle under there with them. But the Marines, they just took care of us. They gave us um, coffee and just whatever they could to keep us warm. And it took 12 hours, and we only got as far as Hawaii. And we landed with the Marine base there. I don't remember how you say it correctly. Is it? I don't know. I don't know what it's called. But anyway, uh, we landed there, and a big Samoan lady came and and threw our stuff like one-handed into the back of her taxi. The most joyful, one of the most joyful women I've ever met in my life. Uh, just happy as could be with hands as big as your head. And she drove us to the, um, to the memorial before bringing us, uh, I think we stayed, I think there was a terminal near Waikiki Beach, if I'm not mistaken. And again, never went out and explored the island, but what I could see of it, it was just absolutely gorgeous, but expensive, extremely expensive. And we'll talk about that later regarding holding this conference here in Hawaii. But um, so I think about this place and I always envision um, GIs coming there for the first time and being invited by these people, you know, maybe being ambushed somewhere in a commissary or something and it just bothers me that they're going to be treated to this level of of caste of a system of hierarchy of who is more important than someone else and you call someone a heavy hitter if he doesn't know what the word means and he shouldn't be using it because um, using it the way it's meant it, it, it's saying something. It really is saying more than maybe he wants to say or realize it because he's so deep in. But that gets portrayed to these, um, to these service members. Um, I would imagine mostly Marines on Hawaii, but there's Air Force there as well and 
I don't know if the Army has a presence, the Navy. So anyway, let's, let's go on from here. Um, you know, I just, ugh, this really, really gripes me, this part. I think you're going to get a buzz here on this one, sir. All the heavy hitters show, start showing up at church for the shouting down the walls. See the posters right here on the wall? Shouting down the walls conference is going to be October 17th in Gathering Fellowship at 7:30, and we're going to be host or they're going to be holding that at First Baptist Church on California Avenue. They're uh, a local church here. I got to know some of the pastors in the neighborhood in the area, and uh, Pastor Bong. Okay, how cool is that name, Pastor Bong? And a, and a family of God there are being a blessing to us, letting us hold our conference at their facility. What did he just say? They're going to have their in-gathering, which is just fellowship. And then he goes on to say that he met some local pastors. And they're going to hold the conference at this First Baptist Church. Now, you know, I know through the years there are people who rented spaces in cities when they first got there in churches, which ooh, that always seemed like an iffy thing to me because it's really you're in someone's house, basically. And I don't know. I, I don't know how you feel comfortable doing that. Well, having said that, <laughs> it might be better than... I mean, we held church services in Pittsburgh downstairs in a, I'll call it a basement. <laughs> and the people that came in had a, <laughs> it's kind of funny now when I think of it. <laughs> it's so goofy. It's so goofy, the things you do, because you just want to have a place to bring people. And you know, what's funny is, so it was, if you look up, I don't know if it's still there, but Bellevue uh, is is right on the outskirts of the actual city of Pittsburgh. And it was the police station there. It was this old brick building, and you walked in the door, and then there would be the plexiglass where you would speak to somebody, and then there was a door, so they would have to buzz you in, and then you'd go downstairs. It almost reminded me... Uh, my daughter went to kindergarten there at that school down the block and it was another old brick building just smelled like and felt like schools felt when I was going to school in the 60s it just reminded me of that and the police station was that way it had old wood banisters and and stairways that led down the stairs which it's pretty much literally a basement, but they did have a meeting room. I don't know who met in there. I guess the elders of the city. I have no idea. But there was a there was a proper a lectern and folding chairs, wooden folding chairs to put out. And, and we just tried to make the best of it. It's very funny that how many people went, I mean, came there and... But a lot of people were afraid because they had had run-ins with the law and they didn't want to, like, make eye contact. <laughs> uh, this is funny now, thinking of all the different... I'm just thinking of all the different people and all the different things that happened there. And that is a story for another time that I'll share with my daughter, Diana. We, I think that's the next thing we want to we want to uh, talk about in our next interview. But she has her her um, drill weekend long weekend four days that she's got to give vaccinations and test medics on their skills and stuff so she's she's quite busy where was i before i so rudely interrupted myself oh yeah yeah yeah. so they're having this conference bringing people in you know how expensive it is i was looking up flights it's expensive to fly right now as it is. You have to take these off-hour times. And most of the time if you do that, because I was going to visit a friend in Utah and I told her this would be pointless to take time off from work 
to spend 24 hours layover there, 24 hour layover back, um, just to get a slight bargain. It just didn't make any sense. So I looked up, I had to know, I'm a researcher by nature. So if somebody says something or mentions something, I'm looking it up right away. Um, and so I looked up the prices. I already know it's expensive to live and move and have your being in Hawaii, and it is. I was looking up places where they could possibly be staying and what it would cost a night, even if they got like like um, Crane did in Memphis and maybe got um, like blocked out rooms and got a, you know, a discount. Uh, maybe, maybe they got a good discount, who knows. But um, anyway, it's expensive. But to go to the point where you are going to um, have it in someone else's church, a Baptist church. And what's very interesting is, I'm going to point out some things here as we go along. Keckel actually talks about, I mean, he, he he's staying on more of a focused message than is normal for him. Normally he's all about the enemies and fighting and all. This time it was about salvation and about being filled with the Holy Ghost and that you're not once saved, always saved. And it really, I don't know if he was on board with this whole thing to do that. It just seems crazy. I mean, obviously they're not filming it. <laughs> it's just... I don't know. It's just, it's, it would be weird because it's somebody else's church. And it's a nice church. I looked it all up. I I made sure to reach out and ask specifically uh, the pastor of that church if they believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost or not. Because I didn't want to assume anything. But my ex-husband was Baptist growing up. And whenever we went to Ohio, we always went... We got married in the Baptist church. Um, so I know that's not their thing, but I want to make sure. Did not want to ever assume anything. I will try my best whenever I do these videos to make sure I've done proper research. So he's, he's talking about meeting these other pastors and he's referring to them as the family of God. And I was like, wow. Cardenas is allowing them to be Christians. I find that extremely interesting. I, I don't know how that could be uplifting because I have to imagine, I mean, I don't know if there's going to be someone there from the church all the time, like to open up for them and turn things on and let them know what's what. Like, are they going to scale back preaching and teaching? because of that and then what's the point of the conference because don't people want to go to conference to be taught hard things and yelled at I mean that's usually be thumped on the head so I don't know let's just just move on here uh, because we just look around right now we're just about outgrowing this place. So when you have, bring all those people from out of town in, it's going to be even that much greater as far as the, 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 uh, uh, the crowd that's going to be there. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there for the portion of October 8th from Cardenas' preaching. This actually wasn't preaching yet. He was telling about the conference. And so now we're going to move on to... Sunday the 15th, and I don't remember if this is morning or night. I think it's nighttime, it looks like. Um, and Keckle's there in town, and he's preaching. Now, here's something I'm going to say. I usually look at these churches that are a part of, like they're hosting the, conf the regional conferences. I went and looked at messages from Crane before they came in and what was he talking about before they got there it's the same thing counting down days oh we got three hours today and then we have two weeks and then this day uh, they're gonna come in <laughs> just down to the minute excitement and uh, they did the same thing here in Hawaii I got a feeling I could be so way off 
I mean, I can just be so way, 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 way off. But I got the distinct impression by things he was saying and preaching, Cardenas, here in Hawaii, and by looking at their Facebook page, they come across as if they're trying too hard. And I don't know if they feel the pressure of, you know, Crane, they seemingly had a more, you know, had a, a successful conference, I guess you could say, in that organization wise. I mean, when you look at, they let us see the, the people that were there, they had the pastors and everyone stand up. It's a regional, little regional conference. And a lot of those people were from Graham and had also been to Graham. So you start knocking off people, you're not left with very many at all. <laughs> Um, and so here, I feel like maybe he has the pressure to also do well, to also show excitement. What's annoying is they know that the theme is shouting down the walls. Well, by the time they get to the last conference, the last week of October in Lakeland, Florida, it's going to be spent because these churches are pre-preaching it. And pre-teaching it and and pre-shouting down a wall. How do you pre-shout down a wall? <laughs> it's just silly. It's to me it's just silly. It's just trying too hard. Like, why, why don't you just leave that something special for the conference? And so everybody's in Joshua 6. I mean everybody. Um and so I noticed here that they have, if you look at their Facebook page for Hawaii, they had, um, it might have been the night or two before the Kekos got there, that they did like a shout. They're all standing in the kitchen area, living room area, and they did a shout. And then they had them outside at night, one night, either Friday or Saturday night maybe, um, lighting the little pit fire and sitting around and singing songs while, you know, it just seemed convoluted. It seemed not convoluted, contrived. It seemed a bit contrived, like they were trying too hard. And then that was further cemented in my head when I saw how Cardenas was on October 8th, just... Um, I don't know, just, you'll, you'll see when we go the rest of the service, but then when Keckle comes in, it either seems like, I don't know if there's tension between them or if, um, Cardenas is like, like, why are they in, I, I can't figure out why they're in Hawaii. It's so weird. Don't even have your own place to have this conference. Why do it there of all places? You know, the Keckles can take a vacation there anytime they want. So it can't be that. Um, is it trying to drum up support for uh, sending people to Bible school? Are there people on the edge there? I don't know. It's just so odd. The whole thing is just odd. And then there was an awkwardness um, things that were said by Keckle that almost made it seem like, like he was thumping the head of Cardenas. And I'm, I'm going to show you that here in a little bit. He also mentions about churches that, that don't believe things like, well, they either believe once saved, always saved, or they believe there's no, no, there is no baptism of the Holy Ghost is evidenced by speaking in tongues. They don't uh, believe that it's for our time. And that's what the First Baptist Church, where they're holding the conference, believes. <laughs> oh, maybe they're hoping to get them saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. I have no idea. I have no idea. Okay, let's move on here. Now, it would be nice if... Uh... You could take a little bass out of this microphone. Is somebody back there on top of that? Okay, because it sounds like I have a pillow over my face. I just clean that thing up a little bit. It would be helpful to me because I'm going to need my voice this week. 
and put you in the kingdom of God's dear son. Man, you got a dead church tonight. I'm talking about something God did for them, and they're looking at me like they never heard this stuff before. Now, my that's a burn. Like, oh, snap, dude. You're not preaching to your people all these basic things. What's going on? Why are they just looking at me? Why aren't they getting in? Because you have to have the required response. You can't just sit there and listen and take it in. That is not allowed. With the program. All right, stay in the kingdom of darkness if that's what you want to do. But I'm pretty happy tonight about not being there anymore. Out of the rebellion, I stop lying. Well, I'll say this. If he did stop lying when he got saved, somewhere along the way he picked it up again. Because pretty much this guy has lied about so many people, both that are out, people that for some reason are hanging on in, like my friend Manika, um, saying things about her, humiliating her publicly, and lying about probably, I don't even want to say almost everyone who left, maybe it's everyone who left. His, I think his philosophy is, well, of course, it's he has said it plainly. If you leave, you're the enemy of God because... If you leave NTCC, you have left God. That's what they say. That's what they preach. That's what they teach. That's what they believe. That's one of the holding factors for people that, that keeps them in fear and wondering, is that true? Is it not true? I don't know. But he has lied. He has absolutely lied. He has lied to some of us who were in about people who were out. And then you get out and you find out all the stories. In Christ Jesus. Don't even act like you're not glad about it. This is part of the dog and pony show. This is part of the teaching people uh, the correct way to behave. So he puts out the microphone like that. He wants to hear the amens. Like, don't even act like you're not happy about this or... Or you don't, um, you don't give the proper response. He's gonna get on you till he gets it from you. That's how it works. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. I wasn't checking the clock. I was looking to see if the scripture was up there. Now, of course, for those of us viewing, we have no idea if the scripture was up there or not. I don't know if when it's up there, it's on the screen, because this whole time it has not been up on the screen, to, to my recollection. Um, but then all of a sudden at one point, I don't know that I kept any of that portion here, then the scripture's up on the screen. So it's like the microphone is not right and that's not right. They aren't shouting amens and and woo-wooing when he thinks they should be. Receive the Holy Ghost power from on high. And so when things come their way, they can't stand against it because they don't have any power in their life. So many of these churches that disclaim the idea of being filled with the Holy Ghost, you'll find that they, they justify sin. Instead of preaching, you got to come out of it. They should be telling the world, Jesus saves from sin. Instead of saying, we're all sinners saved by grace, you can't help it. Yes, we can help it. I don't know. This came across to me. He's doing possibly one of two things. He's maybe not happy with Cardenas hanging around with the local pastors, calling them the family of God, renting their places to have a conference for the first organization up before the throne of God that the only hope for the the known world and they have to go to a Baptist church that does not believe what they believe and he lay that out here pretty clearly so he's either not happy with that or he's trying to protect the flock there by letting them know if 
you know, you probably already know that Baptists don't, I mean, he's clearly coming short of saying First Baptist or Baptist, um, that uh, he wants to make sure they know that, yeah, we're going over there to rent their place, but if they're even renting it, who knows? They may just be being a blessing to them. Hope they tithe on the increase, because that's very expensive to rent a rent a place in Hawaii. Just saying, man. Another option is Keckle knew all along, maybe encouraged him to do it. Um, or if it was presented to him, he's like, yeah, go ahead, do that. That's great. We need to get some of these um, service members out to Bible school, so let's do this thing. Amen. We can help it because God not only gives us the choice, but he gives us the power to bind, to break the bonds, and to walk out of the prison. And we don't have to have therapy. We don't have to have withdrawal symptoms. We don't have to have psychoanalysis. We don't have to have motorcycle analysis. All we need is Jesus. He breaks the chains just like that. I find this highly irresponsible. How about you? What do you think about it? I'd really like to know. Um, I know Monica touched on this when she did her last, we did that fourth interview. And I think it's things that I've not thought about. I mean, uh, he's saying this, but yet look at all the people in the organization alone that have been prayed for um, and did not get healed of many things. There are people with, with issues, mental issues. I remember someone when we were in Bible school, I believe had some episodes and it was found out that he had a, a bipolar situation going on and I believe medication helped him and so to mock the whole idea of talking with someone who may be able to help you through some things you know there are a lot of people who have issues due to stress due to bad diet maybe lots of sugar sugar is poison it kill you. It just screw around with your whole body in so many ways. So um, to just say you don't need any of that, you just, it starts to sound like, um, what are those cults that, um, that don't believe in going to doctors and stuff? Is it the JWs? It's just, it's just weird. But um, this, to me, is, is irresponsible. It's one thing to say you believe God will heal, he'll do this, he'll do that. But look at all the instances where that does not happen. And so uh, we clearly see through the years, I don't know that I've spoken to anyone. Uh, there's not one person there in that organization right now or ever who was in some kind of authority who has the qualifications to talk to people and help them and counsel them. There just is not. If you sit down with Keckle, what's he going to tell you? You don't need to talk to somebody else. Just talk to God. You know, that's, that's not helpful. It's just not helpful at all. And I wonder... How many people have suffered things um, health-wise, mentally, physically, that did not need to? Because you have these these people who don't e they don't even help people in their marriages or or uh, people they see struggling. So how does he have the audacity to say these things? It's a it's a show. It's a show. It's a business. Um, he wants to say something that's different than what most people are saying. 
but um, to what end? And I wonder if there are people, well, I know there are. I know there are people who've had children who need some sort of help. You go talk to somebody, you go talk to a doctor, whatever. Tell them what you're, you don't have to go to a doctor that's going to hand over pills for anything. I hate that. When I was in Washington State, I went to a naturalist doctor. And I think I was in there almost two hours with her. And she asked me the things you should ask. You know, what? what is your day-to-day -day life like? Um, what do you eat on a daily basis? Are you stressed? You know, they don't ask you straight out. They're asking you questions to talk about yourself. And so it's the same way with all these other things. And if someone is addicted to something or cigarettes, drinking, whatever, and they get saved, um... It doesn't happen right away, or they do have withdrawals. What, what is NTCC prepared to do, and what have they done in the past? You have to ask these questions. There seems to be many exhortations to um, bring prayers, bring bring concerns before the saints to pray, uh, to pray for healing and people. I didn't really see any of that. I mean, there was like a like a production here or there, but otherwise on a on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, that is not part of the fiber fabric of this organization. Why isn't it? It's biblical. There's nothing that he cannot break, and there's no addiction that he cannot smash. Amen. He said, God sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. This should be one of the very hallmarks of a healthy spiritual organization, is that they bind the brokenhearted. And yet, NTCC, they create the brokenhearted. And when they have the brokenhearted in front of them, what have we seen them do? Pastor, your service tonight. What a wonderful tree. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. Tonight, God's got the deal for you. All you have to do is accept it. Amen. Before Pastor walked away, I wanted you to recognize something. Sir, before the Lord, have I told you anything about uh, I don't know in the last several weeks about what I've shared or what I've preached or what I've uh, uh, given to them. Some of the same things that he shared tonight, you've been hearing from me. Some of you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost and you're just pulling away. And God wants to fill you. God saved you a long time ago and God wants to fill you with his spirit. I think I cut out a part in this that I should have kept, but it doesn't matter. Um, where Keckel was talking about being saved with the Holy Ghost, with the people that were there. But this is the awkward part to me because um, Keckel's trying to turn the service over to Cardenas, the pastor. And you know that he's probably just been sitting there, just swirling in his head the whole thing that or Reverend Keckel thinks I haven't preached to them about being saved, about being filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, I bet that's all he could think of while he was sitting there because you could see from the moment he comes up and he grabs a microphone, he's anxious to say something. And it just seems a desperate attempt by the way he words it and everything. Trying to convince he's saying it for no other reason than to convince Reverend Keckel that he has done that. He's trying to also get across to the people sitting there that I, I haven't said anything to Reverend Keckel. You know, he, he came in and preached this and this is what you need. But it just had that awkward, uncomfortable feeling um the way he went about it and just because it comes across that way to me doesn't mean I'm correct on any of it 
clearly what's correct is he wants to say before the church members there that, see, I didn't say anything to Reverend Keckel, but he's, he's putting this out there that you need to get the Holy Ghost. Some of you need to be saved, and it's right there for you. There's so many times people have told you you can live in sin and still be a sinner and, and still go on to heaven, and I've shared with you the very same things that were being shared tonight. We are not sinners saved by grace. God saved us out of sin and washed us, regenerated us, and made us new creatures. Amen? So come on, let's find. There's a place for you here at the altar tonight. There's a place in heaven for you. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And he said, it's expedient for me to go away so I can send you who? The Comforter. Don't just look around. Remember, we've been praying every single night, preparing you to shout, practicing your shout. Remember, I shared with you, you can have great expectations from God. Come on, let's find a place to pray. Altars open for... It's actually very sad, and I've cut out a lot. This service was long. Um this part was long and arduous and sad to me because this person obvious obviously feels like they have to say things like remember when i taught you remember when i taught you to sh to shout remember when i taught you to pray this way or to do this remember the series i had you know it's just that is someone desperately wanting seemingly I'm just an armchair, you know, behaviorist over here. I admit it. It's just how it comes across is um, after seeing some of his messages and all this one, it's extremely sad to me. Um, this person's under stress of this whole situation, this conference there. Whatever the backstory is does not matter. When someone has to say, remember when I told you and I preached to you and I taught you, there's something going on there. Do you agree? God, this week I pray that you would meet the spiritual needs of everyone that's here tonight. God, we, we've already been preparing to shout. God, we've already gone through practicing our shout. Now this poor man is reminding God of the things that he's done. I think that's one of the things it, when I look at these um, videos is you either can tell if someone is under some sort of duress <clears throat> now, could be, like I said, could be something as simple as just they're hosting a conference and they want everything to go well. Um, and this is a business and this is a conference and, you know, there's a product that needs to be churned out. <sighs> when you look at Crane in Memphis, that was a whole different situation. He was overconfident, you know, but still wanting that that participation from the congregation if he didn't get it he was gonna get it before he moved on it's all these similar traits these trainings uh training people to behave properly and to show them the correct response why can't they just be a free person who has a a, a way that they worship who know, you don't know. They may go home and shout and sing all day long. You just don't know. And to say this is the time when you have to do it. If you're in a service like this and I preach like this and I tell you that and you don't do anything, then, psh, then the preacher isn't saying anything and you're not getting anything. It's... Yeah, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. It's not a good thing, and it's not a healthy thing that you can't be yourself, that you have to be cookie-cutter, 
um, congregant sitting there, a cookie cutter follower. You have to be like everyone else. You have to say amen when you're told. How loud, sir? Louder. God, we, we've understood and realized the expectations that we can have when we have faith and believe in you. And Lord, the last thing that we shared this week or, or in that series was, let's go what? Shout, amen? Let's go shout. And shout takes on so many different forms. You shout when you give your life to God. You shout when you let God fill you with his spirit. You shout when you when you put away sin. Come on, keep on playing. Yikes. <laughs> keep on playing. It's it's a mood setting thing. And you see how cognizant he is of um while he's reciting to God what he's done all week, <laughs> talking to the people, which is weird, odd circuitry of conversation or prayer but he can he's got a mood to set and and I didn't hear the the guy stop playing but I guess he did long enough for him to turn around and make a thing of it but you see it's all to set a mood it's all to bring about a certain result and it's your compliance it's their compliance. And this dude, if he has to, and he did, he'll preach a whole other message. Telling the people, then telling God, and indirectly telling Keckle what he's been doing to prepare his people for what's coming up at the conference. I can't, I can't even laugh at it because it makes me... I don't know. It feels like a like a heaviness, like a burden, like a like you just want these people to be released from this already. Like you just want them to wake up and say, well, "What is all this? It's a business, and you are a franchise location. Possibly you're not churning out enough product." So they have to come check and see what's happening. In the same way that Keckle was like about the microphone and then about the screen, you got Cardenas here turn around to the brother, you know, just making it seem like it's a big deal. I don't know. You shout! Your shout is not just lifting up your voice and screaming, but your shout is the way that you live your life. Your shout! Can I interject something here? I don't know about you all, but I have never been a fan of the altar call sermon where either the same person or somebody different just preaches all over again. <laughs> I mean, I think the human attention span can only take so much. And... Then it just becomes white noise. It's the way that the world sees Jesus in you. Amen? You can shout. And this week, this conference, man, get there and shout. Don't hold back anything. Lift up the name of Jesus this week. And tonight, when you go home, later on tonight after fellowship was all over, we'll stop and we'll pray. You go home and pray. You spend time with God tomorrow and pray, right? I told you we came back from Grand Conference. We're going to start these prayer meetings. We started this and started them and we're not going to stop them. I went to Graham. I came back. I told you we're going to have prayer meetings. And we've had prayer meetings. And he just keeps on going. And he just keeps on running down a list of everything he's done leading up to this conference. This conference, it's being held in a First Baptist church. He went on for another four minutes. Then he told everyone they were going to have nachos upstairs. And then they prayed for the food. <laughs> for going upstairs. I'm exhausted. 